Oh, Father in heaven, that's what we desire in this moment as we continue in our worship of you and you, of your son, Jesus. We want you to speak to us as our Bibles are wide open before us. And Lord, you make staggering claims over and over and over throughout the pages of your word. And Lord, we want to be humble and ask ourselves before those staggering claims, do we really believe them? Do we really believe you? Are we fully confident of your promises to us in the gospel? Father, I pray that what would happen as a result of our being in your word this morning is that we would, at the end, we would, we would worship you more fervently, that, Lord, we would trust you more diligently. Lord, let us see how our confidence is never misplaced when we cast our all on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of your grace in your Son. And it's in his great name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 7. Take your Bibles and let's turn there this morning. While you are turning there, Paul's letter to the Romans, as you know, is really an amazing gospel tapestry, so to speak. There is one gospel reality after another gospel promise, next to another gospel declaration, um, leading up to the next truth from the gospel and gospel achievement and gospel demand, one after another. Each of those is woven together and sewn together with perfect placement and perfect beauty. And Romans 7 is one of those gospel realities in that gospel tapestry, perfectly added at just the right place at just the right time. Romans 7 is not isolated. It's not an interesting, separated theological subject. It's not independent of what it came from in Romans 6, and it is not severed from what follows it in Romans 8. And we should remind ourselves at the outset here of who the master of the gospel tapestry is, that is Romans. Who is the one who perfectly wove together this gospel argument called Romans? Obviously, it's the Holy Spirit. He's the one, he's the only one who knows the mind of of God. And he is the one who loves to reveal the gospel thoughts of God the Father. And he loves to do it in the way that glorifies the Son, Jesus Christ, the most. And Romans 7 is perfectly placed here in your Bible by him at the right time to both reveal the gospel mind of the Father and to glorify the Son. Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit chose something like a human needle through whom he could thread the Father's gospel thought in order to sew this next gospel patch into Romans. And that, of course, is the Apostle Paul. He is God's chosen human instrument and author to co-write by the Holy Spirit, Romans 7. Paul was an excellent choice. For 10 years and three missionary journeys, he preached this gospel. For 10 years and three missionary journeys, he helped believers become established in this gospel. Over that time, he planted church after church after church across the Roman Empire. And he learned over a 10-year span of time three missionary journeys, he learned how to defend this glorious gospel over and over from every conceivable attack and protest against it. Paul was a a choice instrument through which the Holy Spirit could reveal the gospel thoughts of the Father in such a way that would most glorify the Son, Jesus Christ, which, of course, only brings maximum blessing to sinners who believe this gospel. 
it's important for us to remind ourselves of the Holy Spirit's perfect authorship and the Holy Spirit's perfect revelation of the next gospel thought of the Father in Romans 7 before we dig into it. It's crucial for us to remind ourselves um, of Paul's preeminent human qualification to write Romans 7 before we dig into it. Why? Um, because there may be no other chapter with greater divergence of opinion than this chapter in Romans. And before we bring our own varying, differing opinions to it, we should first be awed by the perfect organization of the Holy Spirit and Paul's great God-given wisdom behind it. We should think as highly as we can um, about the authorial intent and the revelation side of this section. And we should be loaded with humility on the opinion side. And reconsider humbly any baggage we bring to it already. So higher thoughts of the Spirit of God, higher thoughts of Paul, the human author, higher thoughts, expecting a a clear, coherent message from the author, revealing the gospel thoughts of the Father, and lower thoughts of our own opinions. That's a good place to be before you study the Bible anytime, maybe most particularly Romans 7 today. Romans 7 is, is not a light, bouncy, theological beach ball for self-confident but opinionated Christians to bat around in debate. It is the perfectly placed gospel argument that must follow Romans 6 and then prepare us for Romans 8. And it must do so perfectly. And it does so perfectly. And so this is what Romans 7 is. So the more we can humble ourselves and see the exalted authorship and revelation and the argument in it, the better chance we have at arriving at its meaning. And I just encourage you, we can't get to everything that is so challenging in this chapter all in one Sunday. I wish we could, but the elders won't let me have three hours. So I just encourage you to have uh, what we might call hermeneutical patience, Um, just week by week. We're just going to put things together, okay? And what I'd like to do this morning for you is briefly introduce Romans 7, 1 to 6, and then we'll look at it more thoroughly next week, Lord willing. But there are a couple of other things we need to do this morning as well. First, we need to see the connection that Romans 7 has with Romans 6 and even Romans 5 a little bit. And then we also need to grasp the bigger picture of the historical setting of the Jews and their law before we get too far into this chapter. So these are the things that if we take a good look at them, they're going to help us make the most uh, sense uh, of this most challenging part of Romans, which is actually found in the latter part of the chapter, verses 14 and following. So first, let's just talk about the connection that Romans 7 has with Romans 6. Go back to chapter 6, verse 3 for a moment. Look what it says. Or, Or do you not know? Look over at verse 16 of chapter 6. Do you not know? And now look at 7.1 and see if that sounds familiar. Or do you not know? There is a running theme that connects these two chapters together right there, and it, it is this pastoral concern that Paul has that the believers in Rome must know crucial gospel truths. Paul had a concern in Romans chapter 6 that the believers could not be ignorant of crucial gospel realities, crucial gospel achievements for them. And then that pastoral concern continues into Romans 7. He's ready now, once again, to lay out plainly the next gospel truth, and it also can't not be known. This leads to the second connection that's between the two chapters. So there's like a pastoral connection between them. 
But what is this that can't not be known in chapter 7? Look at verse 1. I'm speaking to those who know law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. It's the law that is a connection between the chapters. Paul mentioned the law way back in chapter 5. In fact, you can take a look at one of the mentions of it in chapter 5, verse 20. Look at it. Law came in so that transgression would increase. And then he brought it up in chapter uh, 6, verse 14. You get these amazing declarations. You are not under law. Verse 14. Verse 15, the same thing, but it's a we. We are not under law, but under grace. So Romans 7 then, he's speaking to those who know law, and he's going to talk about its reign as a law. Romans 7 has a law connection with Romans 6. And so it's an interesting thing. Think about it. He said twice in Romans 6, we are not under law. He said that twice. But then he starts off chapter 7 saying, law rules as long as a man is alive. He's going to have to reconcile those two things. In fact, in this chapter, in chapter 7, as I told you, the word law and or commandment occurs about 27 times. So the topic that only got a brief but a powerful statement about it in Romans 6 now gets abundant coverage in chapter 7. So you've got the pastoral concern that links the two letters. You've got the subject of the law and its rule and its reign that links the two chapters. Now let's begin to think about the gospel argument in verses 1 to 6. Let me read it for you. You can follow along. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning um, the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren... You also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now... We have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Paul begins by saying that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. The law rules over a person as long as he lives. And by the way, the law here in Romans 7, I think, is predominantly Mosaic law, but we'll let each appearance of that word speak for itself as we go. But the Holy Spirit wants this to be very clear as he develops the next gospel thought. Think carefully about this. This is where he wants to lay out clearly. There is no way out from under the reign of the law as long as you are alive. The implication then is what? Only death can change that. Only death can change that. This is the sobering gospel fact or gospel truth that can't not be known. Do you not know this, he says? The law rules with decisiveness. Let me give you an example of how this idea of having jurisdiction over or ruling, how this word works in the prior chapter. Go over to chapter 6, verse 9. He says there, death no longer is master over him. At the end of the verse, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. That's the same idea of ruling in chapter 7, verse 1. Look at chapter 6, verse 16. Uh, Or is it 
I'm sorry, it's verse 14. Sin shall not be master over you. So listen, between his crucifixion and between his resurrection, Jesus wasn't mostly dead. He wasn't barely alive. There was no doubt that he was dead. Death was master over him. Not forever, but during that time, death was master over him. And prior to your conversion, believer, there's no doubt about whether or not sin mastered you or not. It's a decisive mastering that is going on here. And similarly, the same language is used here in chapter 7, verse 1, regarding the law. There is no doubt that the law masters a person as long as he lives. Again, this is what can't not be known. Don't you know this? This can't be casually nodded at. This can't be informally jotted down somewhere, yeah, yeah, Paul, and then lost and forgotten. This must be known. Well, who must know this? Whom is Paul concerned know this? Who are the ones who must know this sobering gospel declaration about the relentless length of law's reign? Well, look at verse 1. He tells you, or do you not know brethren? Brethren. He means the believers in the church. Believers must be convinced of this fact that's being pointed out by the gospel, that, that the law rules until death intervenes. Believers can't not know this. And when Paul uses the term brethren, it's an indication to us that his familial affections are raised in this argument he's making. I mean, he could have just kept addressing them with the second person plural, you, y'all, right? But that didn't capture what he was feeling in his heart regarding them and the law's length of reign. His affections for these believers are stirred. He has a sense of family on his mind as he addresses this important issue and them. He's getting as close to them as he can with, with the closeness that a family member has with another family member, a brother to a brother. My brethren, it only intensifies in verse four. Do you see that? My brethren. He's a possessive family member. He wants to be as close to them as he can be as he makes this clear. Now, now did you see in verse 1 what Paul said about these brethren? Look carefully again. Or do you not know brethren, right here, for I am speaking to those who know law. Paul appears to be narrowing down to a specific subset among the brethren. The ones who have an experiential knowledge of law. So Paul is concerned with a, with a family burden for the believers in the church who have some kind of an experiential knowledge of law. These are the ones in the church who couldn't not know the sobering gospel fact that the law rules as long as life lasts. These believers evidently know experientially something of what the gospel is pointing out about the law. The law does this. You know law. These believers who are familiar with law and with the law's reign, they need to be shepherded with the fact that law reigns a long time until death changes all of that. Well, who in the church in the first century in Rome would these people have been? Which believers would have had experiential knowledge with a law? It'd be the Jew who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And especially the Jew who had been like Paul once was. Paul was very familiar with the law as one who tried to live under it for his own self-righteousness. The Jew who was now saved by grace through faith alone, apart from any works of the law, that is the one that Paul feels a heightened sense of family for. You're my brother. They are the ones who he is burdened for. The gospel lays out clearly this staggering fact about the law. It reigns over a person as long as he lives. And the point to come, as you'll see, 
is that for these Jewish believers in Jesus, that death indeed did come for them. And the law has no more power to reign over them. This is the point Paul is laboring to drive home into the heart of the believing Jew who wants new law like Paul did. The law and their flesh, their unsaved flesh, must not be together. They need to be separated. A release, a severance is de- desperately needed. Remember, Paul just said some very challenging things in chapter 6 without a lot of explanation about the law, about its powerlessness for sanctification in verses 14 and 15. And those challenging gospel truths about the weakness of law as a power, now they need fuller explanation, expansion, instruction. That is what you find in Romans 7. This is just why the law and human weakness must not have a master-slave connection with each other. And Jews with experiential knowledge of the law, they need gospel confidence. You have to imagine how hard it would be for them to hear these things. As those who had ingrained their life under the law for righteousness, to hear these things spelled out in the first six verses... They are the ones who need gospel confidence to live life now apart from the law. So let me briefly walk you through this opening argument in the first six verses this morning, and then next week, Lord willing, we'll dig more thoroughly into it. What is this passage all about? It's this, the believer, but but which believer in chapter 7, verses 1 to 6? The believer who is in need of gospel confidence to live apart from the law, that believer that believer must be aware of five gospel truths. He can't not know these things. What does the gospel want them confident of first? Number one, what we've been talking about, the law rules until a death changes that. That's verses one to three. And the implication from the declaration in verse one is that death is the only way out from the rule of the law over a person. And so Paul provides an illustration of that in verses two and three. How can a death, how does that work? How can a death bring the law's authority over a person to an end? Well, the particular matter of marriage law was a good example of that. Verse two, for the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, If while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. You see, a death is what changed everything for that woman. That woman's relationship under the rule of the marriage law was changed. That illustration... um, of the first gospel truth for that believing Jew was helpful. For the one who had experiential knowledge of the law, he desperately needed this. The law rules you unless, unless a death changes that for you, which is exactly the second truth. Number two, union with Christ ends the law's rule. This is what they can't not know. This is what the gospel wants them to be confident of. Look at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Paul even feels more possessive of them, we said, my brethren. He's trying to get as close to them as he can on this whole subject. And here is the death that actually changed their own relationship to the law. They died, but they died through the body of Christ, which points to his own bodily death at the cross for them. Now, remember in Romans 6, there's a lot of talk about death there, how we died to sin. And like we said there, death is many things. But in those contexts, it was a relationship changer. Death brings about a radical change of relationship for the believer in sin. Sin is still the same old sin, but the believer is a brand new person in the presence of those same old sins. And the same kind of thing is being said here. 
Death is many things, but in this setting, it's a relationship changer. Now, let's keep this point specifically narrowed down to that subset of believers Paul's thinking about. These Jewish believers who experientially know law, they can't not know that Jesus' death is their death to the law, which then frees them from the law. They are the ones who must know this. Well, then what does this mean for the kind of life that they will live in union with Christ? That takes us to the third gospel truth that they must be confident of. Number three, fruitfulness for God occurs only in one place, through union with Christ. They can't not know this. There should be no doubt in their minds about what kind of life will result from being separated from the law, but joined to Christ. Look how verse 4 ends. In order that we might bear fruit for God. Here's what's being said to these Jews in the first century who have believed Jesus Christ. The only way these Jews could finally bear fruit for God was if what? They died with Christ and were separated from the law. They can't not know this. Paul mentioned that briefly back in verses 14 and 15 when he spoke about the power of law being weak. But here he provides more detailed instruction. Then what does that mean then about their old connection to and under the law? Before Christ saved them. What does it mean about that? That's the fourth gospel truth that, must, that they must be confident of. Number four, fruit for death. And that's a strange phrase, isn't it? But that's what Paul says. Fruit for death only occurs under the law's contact with flesh. If the law has contact with the flesh, only one thing will happen. Fruit for death. They can't not know this. The gospel wants them confident of this. When these Jews once lived under the law, they thought the law would restrain their sin. But all it did was inflame their sinful passions. Look at verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Our sinful passions were aroused by the law. And the outcome of that was a deadly kind of fruit bearing, fruit for death. Spiritual death just kept receiving an endless delivery of fruit for it from that terrible union between their unsaved flesh and the law that was ruling over them. That was the very best that their good works of the law could come up with in the flesh, was fruit for death. What a contrast of lives. What a contrast from a life that is now actually fruitful for God through union with Jesus Christ, which leads to the last gospel truth that they must be confident of. Number five, release from the law's domination begins a slavery in the spirit's newness. They can't not know this. But now that these Jews who experientially no law, now that they are united with Christ, an entirely new life has begun for them. A life once lived in the oldness of the letter, which is the law, that's over. Look at verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. They were bound by the law, But now they have been released from the law. But notice what kind of life they were released to so that we would serve in newness of the spirit. And that's too boring of a word. It should be so that we are slave in newness of the spirit. So that sounds like Romans chapter 6. From one slavery before Christ to slavery in Christ, right? Slavery to God, slavery to righteousness, Slavery to obedience to God. And now we're finding in chapter 7, slavery in the spirit. It's newness. So the Jewish believer in need of gospel confidence to live apart from the law must be aware of these five gospel truths. 
You can see them there. Number one, the law rules until a death changes that. Number two, union with Christ ends the law's rule. Third, fruitfulness for God occurs only through union with Christ. Fourth, fruit for death only occurs under the law's contact with flesh. And number five, release from the law's domination begins a slavery in the Spirit's newness. Now, next week, we'll go through that in greater detail. But I want you to see that's where Paul pushes us and points us at the beginning of the chapter. This is what these Jewish believers in Jesus Christ must know. They would be the ones in need of the most shepherding upon hearing staggering gospel declarations in Romans 6 about no longer being under law, but instead being under grace. Can we, Paul, you keep saying that, can we, can we really trust that life separated from law and, and from the law that God gave to us will be a life pleasing to God? I mean, they were so preconditioned prior to their conversion that the law was their power to please God. That was the Jewish psyche. Now listen, all believers in the church need gospel confidence that they do not live under the reign of any set of religious rules, but especially the Jew who was once like Paul was. These are the ones who needed the gospel confidence that they indeed, because of their union with Christ and his death, that they were finally free, free from the law. And they were finally fruitful for God. Imagine hearing that. Free from the law and finally fruitful for God? Because of Jesus? Paul feels for his brothers and his sisters in Christ who, who knew experientially law. He, he was like them. He knew what it was like to come from where they came from. And he wants to give them gospel confidence that the law and the flesh create actually a hideous and deadly combination that must come to an end forever. He wants them to have gospel confidence that indeed God knew this. And God provided his son as the only means of separating them from the very law that he gave them as a people. Mosaic law. He put them under it at Mount Sinai. He's the only one that can separate them from it. And he did it through the death of the Son in their place. And by the way, do you notice um, the pronouns in chapter 7? Notice how Paul gradually but surely involves himself more and more and more over time. Um, you start off in chapter 7, verse 1 with you, uh, you, and that carries through most of verse 4. And then you, at the end of verse 4, you get a we. Um, let me just show you what verse 4 does. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who is raised from the dead, in order that what? We, all of a sudden he throws himself in with them. He identifies with them, doesn't he? Um, especially he knows what it is like to be unsaved and under the law, to have his own sinful flesh in direct contact with the law. That's where his identification with them is concentrated most in verse five. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by, aroused by the law, they were at work in the members of our bodies to bear fruit for death. That's their common unsaved condition united with law. And pretty soon, by the time you get to verse 7, Paul will finally put his own life alone on display to them, moving to I. To display to them what his past life was like when he was unsaved and under the law, bearing fruit for death. Now, to try to help you understand Paul's pastoral burden here for these in the historical setting, that kind of gives you a picture of 
where verses 1 to 6 are going, where the whole chapter is kind of headed. But I want to help you try to understand where these kinds of Jews came from and what God was doing on a bigger scale on the international side of things. I want you to understand the bigger picture of what God was doing in Paul's day. It's really actually staggering. Every Jew traced his life back to Abraham, right? Paul spent quite a bit of time on Abraham back in Romans 4. Why don't you turn back there for just a moment to Romans chapter 4, verse 3. In that verse, Paul is referring to Genesis 15, 6. Look what Romans 4, 3 says. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, if you remember, Paul's whole argument there in Romans 4 was that salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, uh, entirely apart from works of the law, was not something new all of a sudden that he was preaching. Because here is the power of grace all the way back in Genesis 15 with Abraham. And he is the foundation of the Jewish people. I mean, they traced themselves back to him both corporately and individually, didn't they? So before the Jews were to be anything else in the world, before they were to do anything, they were to be a people who lived under the grace of Abrahamic faith. Abrahamic faith was the call of God in the Old Testament to the Jews to come under grace and to not come under works of law. Now, did all of the Jewish people do that? Unfortunately, no. But some did, for sure. They lived under grace, but most, most did not. They would not come under grace because grace denied them what they loved. They loved themselves and their own ability to do what they thought pleased God. And grace denied them that. Now, that gives you two very different kinds of Jews in one Jewish people, doesn't it? Let's think about those two very different kinds of Jews within that one Jewish nation. Let's, take a, let's talk about the Jews who actually did humble themselves. And they came under grace alone, through faith alone, apart from any works of law, just like Abraham did that. What happened to them at Sinai then, at Mount Sinai, when the Mosaic Covenant came? Well, they were under Mosaic law. They were under Mosaic Covenant and law. But they were not under it in the way that Romans 6 talks about being under law. They were just Jews and God gave them the Mosaic Covenant with all of its laws, and they were under it. They were obligated to obey it. But the one who was under grace already, or who came under grace in the centuries to come, but then they had the law before them, they didn't have a problem with Mosaic Law. They loved it. But because they were under grace already, they believed that they were not saved by those good works from the law, but they believed Mosaic law pointed them to holiness and obedient living, and so they gladly accepted that directional look from Mosaic law. And wouldn't saved parents, parents saved by grace, wouldn't they raise their children this way? Remember Abraham? Abraham? No works of law. Circumcision isn't what did it for him, but he believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. That's who we are. That's who you must be. Will you come under grace, they could say. Mosaic law to the Jew living under grace and Abrahamic faith was not a stumbling block. Do you want proof? Read Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is written by a Jew who was under the grace of Abrahamic faith and the law for him was not his power for sanctification. It was his pointer for sanctification. 
So the Jews who did humble themselves, and they did come under grace alone through faith alone, quite apart from works of law like Abraham did, they rejoiced under Mosaic law. It was, again, a pointer for them in their sanctification, but it was not their power for their sanctification. So that's the one group of Jews, and that was definitely the minority within the nation. What about the rest of them? But what about the other Jews? What about the Jew who heard the call to come under grace in Abrahamic faith, but refused? What would happen to that one who wasn't interested in living under grace by faith alone in Abraham, like Abraham did in Abrahamic faith? What kind of Jew could he become? Well, he would be one who was, in a sense, double under Mosaic law. God gave the Mosaic covenant and law to him as well, just like all the rest of the Jews. But because he wouldn't come under grace, which denied good works from law, all he could become was what Paul had become. A self-righteous, used the law for righteousness Jew. You see, if you reject, this is true in any era, if you reject coming under grace, you can only be one kind of person. One who is under law as a power. Or, if you're a Jew in the first century, one who is under the law for the establishment of your own righteousness. That is the only option left for you outside of the power of grace, if you reject the power of grace. And that is what the nation, the Jewish nation, predominantly became. The Gospels reveal this, do they not? Isn't this what's pouring out of the temple? Acts proves this as well. What did Paul find from one synagogue to the, I mean, all over, scattered all over the Roman Empire are these Jewish synagogues, and what are they spewing forth? Every single one of them won't come under grace, under law. These were the Jews that Paul had the most difficulty with in the synagogues on his missionary journeys over 10 years. They heard the preaching of the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone, apart from the works of the law, and they rejected it. Why? Because they had already rejected it in the call to come under grace in Abrahamic faith. Abrahamic faith was the first expression of grace that denied these Jews their works of law. And now grace, that same expanded grace in the gospel continued to deny them their works of the law. And so, of course, they rejected grace. And add to that a Messiah from Nazareth, crucified publicly by Romans. You attach that kind of guy to that grace, and they were repulsed even more by the grace of God in the gospel. And Paul had been that Jew, hadn't he? Now just pause for a moment and think of the condition of the Mediterranean world at that time. Think of the international scene going on there. Look at the nation surrounding the Jewish nation. What had happened? In front of all of the nations, in front of all of the Gentiles, here is one nation putting on display in front of all of the rest of them the devastating relationship that his good law had on their unsaved flesh. They were a nation on a stage, on a platform in front of all of the other nations showing what happens when you reject the grace of God in saving faith. A good law, like Mosaic law, becomes a twisted tool in the proud heart of a self-righteous religious person. Sinful flesh. And the good law are in a terrible relationship with one another on the stage in the Mediterranean world, from one city to the next. That's being broadcasted from the temple in Jerusalem 
and from every synagogue across the Roman Empire in Paul's day. And listen, it is not a Jewish problem. It is a human problem. If God had done this with any other people, this is what would have been the result. Any nation would have succumbed to this. So what is God's answer to this devastating condition? It it just seemed inevitable that most of the nation would just fall into this devastating relationship with, with God's good law. Did God know this? We know he didn't intend for his people to try to do works righteousness to be saved. We know that. So then why did this happen? So that God himself could provide the very death that separates the believing Jew who knows law from the very law he gave him. And if God Think about it, on an international scene, if God can change that devastating relationship between sinful flesh and his own law in one of his Jewish people, then the same can be done for anyone anywhere else in the world. God alone had the power through his grace alone in his son to provide the death that would sever the self-righteous Jew from the devastating reign of the law over him. It was only the death of his son. And when God eventually saved that prideful Jew by grace alone through faith alone, and then when he united that stubborn Jew to Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, then that humbled Jew was released from the very law that God gave to him, but that he was enslaved under, so that he could now finally be fruitful for God. And the point of Romans 7 is that Paul is burdened. Paul is burdened to give full gospel confidence to the believing Jew that he is indeed separated from the law that had once ruled him like a master. That believing Jew who experientially knew law, had formed a rut, a pattern in his life. His only pattern of life prior was to allow the law to be in full contact with his lost flesh like Paul did before Christ saved Paul. But now, this new Jewish believer more than ever needed to see God's sure, God's sure gospel plan to separate forever unsaved flesh from his good law. That Jew, like Paul, who labored to use law in their own power to achieve their own righteousness, they needed gospel confidence to know, to believe that the law and sinful flesh were a devastating duo together. They needed to believe that declaration that the gospel was making. They couldn't not know that. In fact, Paul could give them a vivid picture into just how devastating the relationship is between fleshly weakness and the good Mosaic law because he was once there. And that's what begins to happen in chapter 7, verses 7 and following. Sinful flesh and good law from God together are in a vicious, devastating relationship with one another. And the only hope for one like that is Jesus Christ. This is the main thrust of Romans 7. Good law from God and sinful, lost, weak flesh must be forever separated from each other if the sinner is to be saved and then pursue a life of sanctification. And Paul, when he looks back on his former life that was empty of Jesus but full of Mosaic law, that life was a terrifying example of why sinful flesh and the law must be separated by the death of Jesus Christ on behalf of the sinner. So in the church, 
in the first century, a Jewish believer like Paul, like these brethren in the church who, who knew law and knew how it worked, were, they were something of an amazing display for the world to look at. They once fully entrusted themselves under the power of God's law to attain their own righteousness. But when their sinful flesh then came into contact with God's good law, disaster ensued for them. A disaster that they found out over time if they came under conviction, a disaster they found that they were powerless to change in and of themselves. But God, but God through the grace of the gospel before the watching world brought that devastating relationship to an end through that Jewish believer's union with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And finally, that Jewish believer, quite apart from the law, actually became fruitful for God. All because of Jesus Christ. And you say, so what? I'm a Gentile, and it's 2,000 years later. There are a couple of Jews in here. So what, even for you? <laughs> can, we first just, can we first just acknowledge and marvel at the price God paid to separate his Old Testament people from the law that they had become enslaved to? He did it at the cost of his own son. I don't need to write myself into that for it to have meaning. That means something. And we can just humbly worship. That's our God. He did that. We feel a little removed from that. But he did that, and we should just stop first and foremost and just worship him for that. But this does have implication for you and me. And here is the enduring, the enduring message of Romans 7 that you today can't not know. You say, what is that? You need to know, number one, your own fleshly inability to do what is pleasing to God. You need to know that. You need to know your own fleshly inability to do what is pleasing to God. And number two, you need to know any religious law's inability to make you pleasing to God. You need to know those two inabilities, your own fleshly inability and any moral law's inability to make you pleasing to God. And when you put those two inabilities together, you are in a slavery um, to sin, you are in a slavery to law, and in a slavery to death that you cannot deliver yourself out of. And believers like Paul and other Jews in the New Testament that God has locked into his scriptures for us to read 2,000 years later, these who knew law and its reigning power, they get to stand before you as you read it and study it. They stand before you as the perfect example that your sinful flesh and any moral laws are powerless to make you pleasing to God. Romans 7 says your only hope is Jesus Christ and his grace. You must believe him and you must believe him alone to be your savior from the wrath of God that you have merited. And in believing him, you are called to put no confidence in your flesh, nor in any moral law to try to do some good works. You are not called to believe and try to do good works. You are called to set aside good works from any moral law and simply cast yourself on Jesus Christ. And in so doing, God declares over the believer a status of righteousness that is his very own, such that when he sees it, he rejoices and accepts. What you discover is that God has in that very same grace actually united you to Jesus in his death and resurrection somehow. And the effect on you is that your sinful flesh and the weakness of any law are finally and forever separated from one another. And you are not some rebel. You are now finally 
separated from that, fruitful for God. This is the only way to be fruitful for God. These are staggering claims that are made about rules and moral laws and stuff, and staggering claims made about the gospel, staggering claims made about your weakness in the flesh. Do you believe it? Do you not know? As long as you have confidence in your flesh, though, and as long as you think you just need a better set of moral rules around you, you're actually doomed in that life. You may try, and you may try to do what is morally right. You may fight your hardest to do what is right, but you will only ever fight and fail. You can read the rest of Romans 7 and see that. If you have not turned to Christ today and turned away from your good works to simply and only believe in him, will you do that even now and be freed? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for these amazing and powerful gospel declarations made to us. Some of them present some really um, bad news to us. But we're already prepared by that because Romans began with the bad news. Romans 7 just gives us a little bit more of it. That even a good law reigns over a person as long as they live, especially over the one who wants to use it as a power to achieve self-righteousness. Lord, I pray for anybody here today who has had it in their minds that what it means to be a Christian is to um, follow some rules, try not to do some things and try to do other things, and they thought that that somehow would put some good works in a scale and tip things in their favor. Lord, would you please make it clear that um, today to them that without faith is it, impo it is impossible to please you. Father, may we have full confidence today that the way to a fruitful life before you is, is through the life that is united with your son crucified and raised from the dead and separated forever from law. Fruitfulness coming apart from the law. What a staggering claim. Do we believe it, Lord? Thank you for the grace of God that reigns over us. May we believe it more even today. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.